that I have it laid out to present. Uh, I like this passage of scripture. I think it has some very practical things. Uh, one of the things that it does is uh, it really actually helps us uh, in an area which I think is important in the world that we live in. Uh, there are a lot of things going on around us. Uh, there are a lot of voices that are speaking into our lives. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of noise, an ambient noise level that is uh, difficult to get past. And I think that uh, one of the uh, disciplines of the Christian life is meditating upon God's word. And as a part of that, I believe that God wants us to have uh, some other disciplines, and I, I think that he has programmed into life things that act as almost a punctuation point to remind us of where we should be, and uh, to, you know, he's put those in place so that uh, we can have as a part of the regular rhythm of life a way of, uh, of keeping our hearts aligned with him. This morning we're going to examine a passage of scripture that contextually really is centered around the practice of the Lord's Supper or communion. Uh, do you all remember the other names that uh, we looked at, the four names there? Uh, so the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper, Communion, and Eucharist. And so, you know, as we examine uh, this ordinance that God has delivered to his churches to get, uh, to practice, I, I think that sometimes, especially in uh, our, uh, what would be referred to as low liturgy, uh, so not necessarily a, a high liturgy uh, of worship, you know, where we have a lot of uh, ritual and a lot of formality, uh, but sometimes I think that uh, maybe we don't give enough credence to the rhythm of things that God has put in place, and uh, we periodically practice taking the Lord's Supper. We do it on Sunday evenings, and uh, it is a, a part of family business for us, much like uh, our stewardship meeting, uh, which is uh, family business for us as a church. And we gather together for this, and, and typically during our taking uh, together of the Lord's Supper, uh, as we gather as a church, uh, there will be a time of reflection, a time for us to almost symbolically give a nod to something that Scripture talks about, which is preparing ourselves uh, for this act of worship which God has given us to observe as a church. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that part that I'm referencing there is the self-examination that uh, scripture pushes us towards, which I believe is, especially as a periodic discipline, is designed by God to help us align ourselves, to give us these marks in life where, you know, uh, I may have been uh, wrapped up in what goes on every day. I may have gotten busy. Yeah, I'm in church on Sunday, but we're getting ready to uh, partake of a part of worship that when scripture speaks of, it, it ascribes a weight to it and a significance that, that really bears maybe additional interest and additional preparation for me in my heart. And uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at. In this passage, the Apostle Paul was dealing with uh, a church that had some difficulties in that area. And we've talked about some of their practice and the way that that wound up uh, the outworking of that in their congregation. Uh, we talked a little bit about the culture and what it contributed to it. This morning, as we examine it, uh, it's kind of interesting. I noticed that as I was preparing for uh, the sermon, I ran across something that said that uh, the passage that we're looking at here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is potentially uh, the earliest written account uh, of the Lord's Supper and how a church should uh, partake of that, how, how we should practice it. Uh, if you go back and look at the dates of the Gospels, I think that Matthew and Mark are two that were dated sometime, I believe it was sometime between 55 and 60 A.D., uh, some of the earliest uh, written accounts of the gospel there. And uh, we know that the book of 1 Corinthians was probably written right around 55 A.D., I think is, if I remember uh, correctly as I was studying this. And uh, so it's interesting to me that even though Jesus uh, walked his disciples through it, that, that first group of people, saved, baptized people, as he instituted this covenant dinner, if you want to call it that, uh, we, we know that he also called apart the Apostle Paul. And three years in the desert of Arabia, Paul says, actually, God, Jesus Christ delivered this to me. He told me this is the way that we were to practice. So Paul, evidently, uh, was of the habit of teaching the churches that he planted or the churches that he was involved in in his missionary journeys. He was of the habit of teaching these things to them that God had given him, that Jesus Christ had allowed him to understand. And we know that each of the Gospels, specifically the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
uh, that those three give us a detailed account of the institution or the instituting of the Lord's Supper. John, not so much uh, giving us uh, the details of blow by blow of it happening as much as insight into the discourse that, that uh, Jesus gave during that particular portion of time. Uh, from John 13 to John 17. If you ever open up your Bible, you'll note there's a lot of red letters there. I don't know if you ever noticed that. So it's kind of interesting. But Paul lays out for the church at Corinth there uh, some instruction in this. And evidently it was pretty important because this isn't the first time that we've actually covered a portion uh, of instruction for the Lord's Supper in our study through the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, we looked, uh, remember in the last couple of weeks where Paul was saying, uh, you guys have got it all wrong. Uh, you come together, and he said, I want you to understand that the picture that, that Jesus Christ wanted the supper to portray, what he wanted it to be seen as, what he wanted the experience to be lived out in your congregation is not there. There's an inconsistency, and, and there's some consequences for that. There's some repercussions, and actually Paul says some pretty serious things in this. this. So there's one of my famous, uh, what is it, about a fourth of my sermon introduction. Let's move on and uh, read the text here. Paul says to the church there, Corinth, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing... He is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another, and if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. And the remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Isn't that an ominous way to end uh, a chapter? Uh, it reminds me of, uh, you know, when I, was, uh, when I was growing up, my mom and dad. Uh, I remember my mom more than once at church. After I had been misbehaving, she would look at me and she would say, you just wait till I get you home, you know. Or more often than not, it, it, that wasn't really what she said. She says, when we get home, your dad's going to talk to you. <laughs> I knew what that meant. And um, it was ominous. And, you know, this is uh, kind of Paul ends things there. And you wonder, like, why did, what would he, you know, the remaining matters I will arrange when I come. When I get there, I'm going to get this all straightened out. And I think one of the things that it does for me is it kind of conveys the idea of the significance of this. Uh, as far as the Apostle Paul was concerned. And he ascribed spiritual significance to it. And the self-examination that was there was meant to preclude some of the things that the Scripture actually explicitly speaks to. And this was such a serious matter that Paul said, because of the way that you've practiced this, because of your missteps in administering this, he says that there are some of you that are sick, and there are actually some of you that sleep. And this wasn't an accusation or a condemnation of people who nodded off during the service. This was a euphemism for death. And so as Paul laid these things out there, I'm sure that it got people's attention. It gets my attention. And as he said, I'll set the remainder of things in order when I get there. So this morning, what I'd like to do is I would like to focus uh, primarily, at least as far as a structure for our text, on, on the things that Paul said that we are to examine in, in light of these things. The context that God had given for that church there, the things that he wanted them to look at. So we're going to examine four directions in which we need to look as a church, as we practice the Lord's Supper, some things that we need to internalize as we prepare ourselves to partake of this ordinance, which carries such significance, which has such weight, and which has such uh, such heavy uh, repercussions uh, as according to scripture if it's not practiced according to way, the way that God uh, wants us to practice it. And for me as I examine this, I think, you know, for our church as I have explained as we've gone through this, that our practice for this is we believe that we do not have the authority to extend the Lord's table 
to anyone who is not a part of our church family. Because we believe the scripture teaches that we can only extend the Lord's table to people that we have the authority to discipline, and we cannot discipline anyone who's not a part of our covenant membership. And so this practice for us is to try to stay in line with this. And as far as the repercussions that Paul lays out there, to me the significance of it is, is that as a church, one of the kindest things that we can do, one of the most loving things that we can do, is to keep someone from inadvertently, in their ignorance, or perhaps their rebellion, practice or taking the Lord's Supper in a way that might put them in a position of judgment from God. And, you know, that's, that's something that we try to take seriously. So, as we look at this, the four directions of this self-examination, kind of a scary thing, you say the significance of this examination of self, it must be, it, it must be pretty intense and it must be in-depth, and we want to go in and we want to root out any hidden sin that's there, right? And we want to make people feel as lowly as we can so that when they come to the Lord's Supper, they know in humility that they're not worthy as they partake of that. Is that, is that the objective in this? No, no, it's not. And I think we'll see that in just a moment. But we're going to see that what God has wired into this punctuation point of Christian discipline to help us periodically uh, in, in fact, remind and, and, and force us into a place where we go through self-examination is he's given us some directions to look. One is to look back to the cross of Christ. The second one is to look ahead to the coming of Christ. The third one is to look inside ourselves with the mind of Christ. And the fourth one is to look around us at the body of Christ, that assembly of people who have come together underneath the headship of Jesus to practice this ordinance in accordance with his word. So this is, this is the way that God has packaged all of this up. Uh, he's, he's laid it out, I believe, in a very precise way. So let's take a look this morning uh, at this, this first aspect, if you will, of self-examination. And you noted as I walked through the text that Paul talked about examining, and we'll look at that passage in just a moment, but I believe that the things that are pushed into the text really give us a direction to look. And, and I think it's important that as we practice as a church the Lord's Supper, that we understand it was designed, we talked about this, to be a remembrance. There needs to be something in your life, a remembrance of what? Of what Jesus did on the cross and its personal worth, its personal impact, its personal uh, interfacing, if you will, with your life. That means that it's kind of like an anniversary, that it would be silly for us to celebrate an anniversary of something that never happened, right? And to look back in remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross and not understanding that the significance of that is that he did it for us. When I partake of the bread and when I partake of the fruit of the vine, that I am remembering what Jesus did for me on the cross, for me. So I look back to the cross of Christ. We see this uh, in, uh, actually, we see it in, uh, uh, in the first passage of Scripture, the first verse of Scripture in our text. I'll look at it in just a second. But I wanted to note, as we look back, that God has purpose in this, in looking back. He wants to ensure that we are grounded in the cross of Jesus Christ. He wants to ensure that we are taken back to the place of his death, the place where he shed his blood, the place where his body was broken for me, for us as a congregation. So that passage of scripture was verse 26 where Paul wrote to the church and he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. I actually covered this uh, as a part of our passage last week, but I wanted to go back to it to pull these points out that help us to understand the focus of our examination, that it takes us back to the basis of our relationship with God, which is what Jesus did at the cross. That's where it began for me. Prior to that, I was in rebellion against him. My death was required. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus died for me. His death is substitutionary. And even as we look at the supper, it is designed for a people 
who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, this is a beautiful passage. The Apostle Paul uh, told us, as he was given this by God, that its purpose was for us to remember or proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's interesting, I believe, that the focus on the cross, bringing us back to the ground of our faith, if you will, is an important part of the Christian life. Jesus spoke in Matthew 16, 24 to his disciples. He told them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Going back to the cross of Jesus Christ is the reminder that we need that he also called us to a cross of our own. As I go back and remember what he did on the cross, he died on the cross so I wouldn't have to die on the cross. So I wouldn't have to pay for my sins. And after he paid that price, then as a disciple, he called me to carry that cross. And I am reminded as I go back, the price that he paid, and then the expectation that comes out of that, the cross that he has given me. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul also wrote, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He takes us uh, in our practice of the Lord's Supper back to the cross of Jesus, the foundation of our faith, reminding us of where Jesus did what he did to put us in a place where our sins were paid for. He freed me when he paid for my sins to now live my life for him, to take up my cross and to follow him. It's a beautiful thing that I believe that he's designed in for a very distinct purpose. The second direction that God has called us to look is ahead. Looking ahead to Christ, looking back to the cross, takes us to the foundation, if you will, of our relationship with him, the beginning of that. But looking ahead to Christ takes us from the ground of the cross to the gates of heaven. It actually ensures that we are more heavenly minded than earthly minded in our outlook and our priorities. That our focus is not continually and, and exclusively on the cross, is it? We lift our heads up from that cross because we know that he hung on the cross and shed his blood and allowed his body to be broken for us. But he doesn't hang on the cross now, does he? That cross is empty and the tomb that they put him in is empty also. And he is coming again for us one day. He's going to come back. I walked through to mess with the copier a couple times during the adult Sunday school class. And I think I did that about three or four times. Randy probably seen me. The rest of you had your back to me. I think each time I walked through, I heard him saying something about Jesus coming back. That's a shock from Randy, right? <laughs> and I thought to myself, do we ever hear that enough? Well, you know, I guess probably the only question is if we get so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. But, the, but the, the beauty of the equation we're looking at is on this linear layout, if you will, he takes us back to the grounding of the cross where we begin in our sacrifice that Jesus made for us and takes us all the way to the end of life for us, which is a heavenly hope, something that Jesus has provided for us. So the scripture tells us, as often as you eat this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's a punctuation point on this line also. Jesus is coming. And that's the point of this. He says, as you assemble together, he said, you're not just remembering my death. He said, you're doing this until I come. I'm coming for you. I am coming for my people. Oh, what a thing to assist us as far as the direction we look and we, as we examine our life. I, I examine my life in the light of the coming of Jesus Christ and I want to have my ducks in a row. And what else? What else? What else? I, I, I want him to be pleased with me. I, I want everything uh, to be in order in my life. These are compelling things that God has placed within the rhythm of Christian life. And we need a place to celebrate those and a people to celebrate it with, which we'll talk about in just a moment. When you examine this concept until he comes, Scripture is replete with examples that allude to this or even directly stated in Titus. He says, looking for the blessed hope 
and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. It's continually this way. He redeemed us from every lawless deed back at the cross and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good, looking for the return, zealous for good today. You see, he's built into this. Now, it, it's, it's very, I don't know if you want to say one-dimensional at this point, but we'll see it goes beyond this. Another passage of Scripture which points us and reminds us of this direction we need to look. Jesus spoke in Luke 21 that, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up. Lift up your heads because your redemption's drawing nigh. Let me tell you, if you think we're in the end times right now, then you better straighten up. Your redemption draws nigh. You know, the call to look for the return of Jesus is not to identify where 666 is getting printed. It's the fact that he's coming back. We've got work to do. There are people out there that don't know Jesus. I don't want them to miss the trumpet call and to endure what Scripture says comes after that. I don't want them to. Who's your one? <laughs> I slipped that right in there, didn't I? All right. So, verse 27 in our text continues in this. Before we move on to the next direction, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Uh, that's a pretty weighty one. We talked about that. The unworthy man, is an unworthy man or an unworthy manner? Uh, this examination that Paul talks about has a very distinct purpose, and it is not to ensure that we are worthy, but that we eat in a worthy manner. And there's a difference there. I ran across a quote that I thought was succinct on this. Unworthy is not an adjective describing the condition of the one partaking of communion, but an adverb describing the manner in which one partakes of the Lord's Supper. All right, so what does that mean? I, I read an example of this, and I didn't really like the illustration that much, but I liked the way it finished. And it said this, it said, the Lord's Supper is for sinners. Does that sound right to you? I don't know about that. I mean, as much as we've been talking about uh, people who have examined themselves, right? But no, it is right. The Lord's Supper is for sinners. Sinners saved by the grace of God and what Jesus did on the cross. Sinners who understand what it means to confess our sin and to find cleansing from it, purification in the, in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. You know, these are things that I think push into my mind as I look at this. The third direction that Paul points us in is to look inside, and this was actually kind of the leaping off point for the examination that Paul says needed to occur uh, for these folks there. He said, uh, you know, really looking inside ensures that we refuse to remain content with just conforming the externals of our life, just going through the motions. And it is an easy thing to do once we establish a habit. I'm glad that you guys have the habit of being here on Sunday morning. I'm praying more people will get that habit. All right? It's a good habit to have. But it can degrade into an external ritualism, can't it? Much like almost anything else that we do. We can forget why we're here. We can think that, well, I don't really like that kind of music, or I don't like this kind. We can begin to think that this service is all about us and not about the God that we worship. And it's not that those things aren't something that impact us, but if we're not careful, we can forget that one of the things that is very clear as we go through Scripture is that God looks on the heart of man not just the outside. And the call to examination really refuses to remain, or for us to be able to remain content with just conforming the externals. And it is asking God to do more than just scratch the surface in our life. It is submitting ourselves to the searching of God's Spirit in our life. You can probably think of verses like that. 
The passage of scripture we're talking about is verse 28 here, where Paul said, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Self-examination. It's a part of the disciplines of Christian life. We can't just conform to the external, uh, you know, ritualism that maybe is not as formal in our case and practice, but still there. We can't allow that. We can't allow ourselves to fall so easily into a rhythm of worship that we forget who we're worshiping and what it's supposed to mean. It, it cheapens and it assassinates the intention of what God had as he put these things together. See, that was the real difficulty that Paul had with the church at Corinth is that they knew all about what he had taught, but they had forgotten the importance of there being a consistency with that practice done correctly and the condition of their heart. They, they just, it had slipped their, I don't know, their recognition. They had drug, is that right, drug? their culture, or they dragged their, you English majors, help me out there. Which one is it? Yeah. Is it drug? Thank you. They drug their culture. <laughs> they drug their culture right in, and they had problems. And Paul said, listen, you don't understand the intention of this. You don't understand that when God sets something up, that it is an external reflection of an internal condition. It's the way the Christian life is consistently all throughout. And it's the same thing in their practice of this ordinance that God had delivered to them. So where do we go from there? Well, you know the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We actually covered this several weeks ago. It says, he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And this is the importance, this is a lesson all by itself of putting the word of God into your heart and allowing the Holy Spirit to use that to search the hidden parts. This is so, so important because whether you realize it or not, you are a victim of your culture. You, you see things culturally. It's almost impossible for us to get, you know, to come out of our culture. We don't even realize it is culture until we go somewhere where the culture is not the same, right? And then all of a sudden we realize that we're not in, well, as the uh, famous movie says, not in Kansas anymore, right? And we talk about this in missiology and the study of missions in the church about cross-cultural ministry. And the reason is, is that we are wedded to our culture in a subconscious way. And if we're not careful and don't allow God's spirit to divide asunder between soul and spirit inside of us and to make the intentions of our heart clear, then we don't ever really change. Oh, we may be a Christian for sure, but there's no real change. People who know us and know us for years, oh, they're a Christian but they're still who they are. And oh, what a horrible indictment that I've never let Jesus change things on the inside that people see so readily on the outside as dysfunction or as wrong. You see, this is what building into our life a periodic discipline and self-examination can help root out. This isn't a one-time thing, though. What this is is it's almost like it's like icing on the cake of allowing God to look into our heart as thoroughly and as easily as we're able to look at other people's hearts, right? You know, I ran across something interesting on that. I set you up. C.S. Lewis said this. He says, those who do not think about their own sins make up for it by thinking incessantly about the sins of others. He says, it's healthier to think about one's own. It is a reverse of morbid. It's not even in the long run gloomy. A serious attempt to repent and really to know one's own sins is in the long run a lightening and believing process. Of course, there is bound to be a first dismay and often terror and later great pain, yet that is much less in the long run than the anguish of a mass of unrepented and unexamined 
sins lurking in the background of our mind. It is the difference between the pain of the tooth about which you should go to the dentist and the simple, straightforward pain which you know is getting less and less every moment when you have had that tooth out. That's, that's pretty good, isn't it? Um, I think God help us to avoid being better at judging other people's sins than we are our own, right? And, and that doesn't mean that I am not capable of looking out at a world which is lost in its sin and its ignorance and its blindness to their need for God. It doesn't mean that I don't see that. It doesn't mean that I excuse it in others even in the sense of saying it's not bad. It just means that when it comes to sin, I'm way more practiced at finding it in my own life than I am in the life of others. That's a tough order, isn't it? It's not an easy one. Look inside and live. Verse 29, Paul said, He who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. And then he gives this in verse 31 and 32. He says, but if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. See, this is correction and not condemnation. It's discipline and not damnation. And it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, I, I thought about this. I, I was telling somebody this the other day. What a horrible thing it would have been if Jesus had been continually just about pointing out the flaws of his disciples. Can you imagine spending three and a half years with someone who knew every thought you had? It would be horrible. I would be... Yeah, it would be horrible. I don't know where that came from, but I can imagine if I had a job, I'd be a workaholic because I would not want to go home to that. I would not. Three and a half years. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I have many things to tell you. He says, but you can't bear them all now. He said, how long will I have to bear with you? Over and over again, I think he demonstrated, and certainly as the perfect God-man, his restraint in dealing with our sin. And uh, I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, the objective here is not to make us feel bad. The objective is to put us in a position where when the chastening of the Lord comes that we are able to bear the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's God's objective in discipline. That's what scripture teaches. People think it's mean and they talk about disciplining your kids and how could you possibly... How could they benefit from someone bigger than them doing? I mean, there's all sorts of thoughts about that. But God's word just says that when we discipline according to the word, that it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I don't know about you, but I think that is a commodity well worth investing in in these days we live. You know, examining oneself for the purpose really of allowing God to discipline me where my heart is errant. Not to condemn me with the world, but to judge me and to help me know. You know, God is the one who we can, like, in confidence, submit ourselves to for constructive criticism. And I'm sorry, but there are a lot of things that we as Christians are proud of in our personalities that do not look like Jesus. And you shouldn't be proud of them if they don't look like Jesus. So how do we deal with that? Well, Paul says... Allow yourself to be disciplined. Submit yourself to God in this area and let his word through his Holy Spirit correct you. And what is that? That's, that's something that God's programmed into the Christian life. Uh, my wife and I were having a conversation and uh, she was telling me that uh, when she accepted the Lord, she was 21 when she, 22, 20. I knew there was a 20 involved in it. This was, so she had 20 years of B.C. in her life. That's before Christ. 
And uh, she was telling me, she says, when she accepted the Lord as her Savior, she said she went to work. And she said there was a guy she worked with that uh, he was uh, uh, he was in Mormonism, was raised in it, but he wasn't really practicing it. And she came to work, and she was smiling, and she was talking to him, and she, was, she said, you're never going to guess what happened this weekend. And he looked at her, and he said, oh, you got saved, didn't you? And, and she told me in this conversation, Brenda told me, she said, I want, I want that back. I, I want that. I want people to look at me and to say, she must have got converted. Are you one of those born again? You went and got saved, didn't you? What, what a horrible accusation to have made against us. You know, uh, in Psalm 51, verse 6, the, the psalmist David wrote this. He said, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. You know what makes that be out like the way that people see it and can't help but notice it? Is it's what's happened inside. We've put truth down inside in a place that maybe it hadn't been very often or before. And it has an outworking in our life and that's that's how it how it really works that's the kind of examination that Paul was teaching the church at Corinth about and the fourth direction is looking around and looking around at the body of Christ looking around ensures that our examination is multi-dimensional and why is that so important well look back at the last diagram I had up there you see how, you see how one-dimensional that is. If we're not careful, we reach this place in our Christian life where, well, everything's okay with me and God. I look back to His cross. I look forward to His coming. I've taken care of any guilt in, in my conscience, and so everything is okay with me. And oh my gosh, what a horrible indictment of the Christian life. Oh, that's, that's horrible. And, and when people tell me that their relationship with God is just about them and God, there is a component missing from you and your relationship with God. I'm not telling you for things not to be okay between you and God. I'm just simply saying, y'all know what meddling is? So I'm going to stop preaching for a minute and meddle. This pandemic has not been good. Now, I'm with you. I like to be at home. I, I do like to be at home. Y'all need to start getting out. You know why? Because unless you've got a whole parcel of people who don't know Jesus coming and visiting you at your house, you're becoming sterile. And I know there's a pandemic on, but you have to note, and even as a church, we're doing things, what? We're trying to help encourage people to get past a year and a half of staying at home. Okay, I was just meddling, and so I'll go back to my text now. Why is that important? Because there are people who think that Things are just about over. This is bad. And you are like a carrier, not of just a virus potentially, but of a message that can bring hope. See, that's just a reality for, for us. So just think about it. I'm not trying to encourage you to be, uh, you know, flippant and take unnecessary risks. But I'm just saying... Think about what God has called us to and why he left us here. And if it's just gotten way too comfortable for you, I'm just going to encourage you, get out a little bit if your health can afford it. And ask God to put some people in your way to tell about Jesus. This is very one-dimensional. Um, there is a beauty and a symmetry involved in that, but 
there's something missing. And when you do this, then looking around ensures that our examination is multidimensional. It is a judgment in the context of community, and it refuses to allow us to personalize our faith to the extent that it becomes sterile, unable to reproduce or cause faith to spring up in other people. Well, faith just wasn't meant to be only personal for us. It just wasn't. And, you know, the context of community is where Paul told them to look. Our text says, he says, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, Wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. And the remaining matters I'll arrange when I come home. Paul actually used, you'll note I have come together there, underlined twice. The Greek word, it's just one word that's translated come together there, is used five times in this chapter. One of those was in verse 17. And Paul said there, he said in giving this instruction I do not praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worse so you see coming together is designed by God to make us better coming together is designed by God to make us better and as we look at the examination that Paul was teaching the church in Corinth it was done within the context of the congregation now yes to prepare outside but to come together and I will tell you that as we partake of the Lord's Supper, for me, I'm usually standing down here, about right here, and reading, and the elements are all laid out, and I'm looking at the congregation, and it's a very intimate, intimate time. It reminds me as I'm looking at the people there that these are the people I've chosen to serve with, the people that I love, the people that love God with me. It's a very personal thing. And, you know, I believe that God designed the introspection and the examination to be something that happens in community. Looking inside, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, the same Greek word is used there, but translated as symbol. And in this verse, which we'll cover in the coming weeks, Paul says that the outcome is that God is glorified in worship and we're edified in each other. What does the verse say? He said, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. And, and see, the worship and even uh, the outworking of the examination that I, I do when I'm looking in is, is done in community. God designed it. He wants us to look around. You see, I don't know how many times a person might find themselves in a place of hopelessness because they've looked inside of themselves and they has, have sin there that is uh, what uh, the King James Version calls it a besetting sin. Things that they can't overcome, things that they go back to, and they've asked God for forgiveness for them for so many times that they're, re they're relatively convinced that he's almost run out of patience with them in it. But in the context of a community of people who love you, you can cry out together with God or with them to God and there's somebody to come alongside you and encourage you and tell you that God is able to do what you cannot do and to walk with you in that pain and in that struggle. And these things are something that God has designed into the process. Dietrich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this in uh, his book, Discipleship, the Christian community is thus essentially the community gathered to celebrate baptism and the Lord's Supper, and only then is it the community gathered to hear the word proclaimed. It's just a part of the disciplines, if you will, that God has wired into Christian life and discipleship, that after I choose Jesus, I need to go and get myself wet. I need to get baptized so everybody it's proclaimed Jesus has my life. And then I need to find a church and get plugged into where I can serve and worship with people and have the kind of relationship that provides the accountability that I need in my Christian life and be willing to extend and give that to other people. Relationships that are more than just, hey, how are you? 
Augustine of Hippo. What a name, huh? <laughs> he said, there is no saint without a past and no sinner without a future. And that is what Paul really wanted them to know, I guess, more than anything. Worthy. It's an adjective. Or an adverb, not an adjective. Here, I'm going to leave you with something. Around 400 B.C., Socrates, uh, who first said this, he said that the unexamined life was not worth living. And he actually spoke this, he was about 70 years of age at a trial where he was charged with corrupting the youth of his day uh, and his refusal to acknowledge the gods of the state. And uh, I in no way want to cast him as Christian in faith because that would not be the case. But it is counted as interesting to me that even someone who did not profess to serve a God, the creator of this universe, understood the importance of an examined life. And I know that that's what Paul was pushing to the church at Corinth. He said, a well-examined life is a life that can be lived for Jesus. It means something. Cameron's going to come and finish this up here. I hate tests. I'm in seminary. I'm in uh, Bible geography class. And uh, geography class is hard. Bible geography class is real hard. Uh, and it goes over things that were thousands of years old. And this week, he was sitting there, and he had the test in his hand. The, the teacher had the test in his hand, and he was going over each and every one of the questions. I sat down. I wrote down each, each of those questions. I made myself a pretest. I don't like tests. I like pretests. You know why? It's important. There's going to be a test. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need this information. This is important information, and it's going to get real important on Friday. Uh, I need that because it's important. And today, Bobby talked to us about self-examination. This is important. The real test is coming. The test is coming. The four directions, the four directions that we are to look at in self-examination. Look back at the cross of Christ, remembering what Christ has done. How did we get here? How did we become? I want that back. Look ahead to the coming of Christ. He's coming again. We have a heavenly hope. This is good news. This is where we're to stand and live. Number three, look inside with the mind of Christ. What's my motive? What's my motive uh, when I'm doing this? Am I coming here for religion or am I coming here for God? Number four, look around at the body of Christ. No war was ever won from the foxhole. You understand? You had to get out there and fight. And isn't it helpful when you have someone there to pick you up and to fight with you? And coming together makes us better. And we ascribe this to communion. We ascribe this to communion because it's important. Uh, we, we are, we here at Sunbreak, uh, think that communion and baptism is wildly important because the Bible says that it's wildly important. And uh, we're conservative about it on purpose. But it's a time of remembrance. And it's a time of remembrance for this, too, for self-examination like Bobby was talking about. Uh, this self-examination that we're to take during the time of communion is uh, it, it's the time of remembrance. Uh, it reminds us to look inside and look around at those around us every day for every decision that we make so that we're living for Christ in everything that we do. And Bobby talked to us about Socrates. For your consideration today, Socrates said that the unexamined life was not worth living, but God says, but God says that the well-examined life will be a life lived for Christ. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we're here for? To live for Christ? So today, at lunch, on your ride home, we want you to talk about, we want you to discuss uh, have you been examining your life? 
do these four functions that Bobby was talking about, do they make it to your daily practice? Do you sit there and examine yourself? Are you trying to win a battle from the foxhole? That's for your consideration today. And now, if you'd all stand, we're going to read together that famous passage we've been reading for the last few weeks from Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And now before I let you out into the wild, I'm going to pray for you. And dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message that you brought today, Father. Oh, please help our hearts to be open and soften to the message, Father. Uh, please help us this week to examine ourselves, to bring these principles into our life, Father, so we make better decisions, so that we're able to glorify you, so that we're able to serve you better this week, Father, so that we're able to bring your word out to a lost and dying world, Father. Father, we love you. We want to show the world that we love you. We want that back. Father, help us this week. Uh, help us to soften our hearts and to uh, join the Who's Your One campaign. But not only that, but to go out there and find our one, to find that one person that we should be praying for that you've placed into our lives, that, uh, that we uh, have been put in their lives to show Jesus. Father, help us to be that person this week. We love you very much. In Jesus' most precious name, and all the people said, Amen.